Dr. Mickey Thomas Terry. Hello, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Good, good. Thank you for agreeing to chat with us today on Ministry Monday. And I asked to speak with you first off, because I know I've shared this with you personally, but I think it, it bears repeating for the listeners, that I had the good fortune of meeting you 10 years ago when I was an Oregon student. And I, for those of you who might be, if you're watching, if you are watching the video version of this, I actually learned a piece from one of your African-American organ music anthologies. I learned a David Hurd piece called Pascalia. And you came for a master class. And so um, I pulled this out recently and it made me remember how much I enjoyed my time with you. And so I reached out to see if we could chat about uh, the contribution of African-American organ composers in the, um, in the field and you obliged, which I'm grateful for. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thank you for asking. So as we start, <laughs> would you mind for the listeners providing just a little bit of introduction about yourself if they may not know you? Well, my name, of course, is Mickey Thomas Terry, mm -hmm. and I teach at Howard University in Washington, D.C., in the music department, and I'm um, a graduate of Georgetown University, um, and um, I have been the editor of this multi-volume series. We are getting ready to produce the ninth volume this spring, um, published by Morningstar Music Publishers. And it has had wonderful success. It was the very first anthology of organ music by African-American classical composers. And so I am very um, excited uh, about each volume that comes forth and because it is putting forth music that either has never been published or things that if they had been published at some point earlier, are now permanently out of print. We also have some compositions that are newly composed. And one of the things that I thought was very important uh, for this anthology is to make sure that there were women represented. And um, so I have uh, commissioned you know, a couple of, of women composers to, to write for the anthology, and I'm very pleased with the result. And um, so I'm constantly looking for new things, and very good things. I try to hold a very high standard of uh, what I select. And there's usually a criterion that I follow in terms of the uh, anthologies. I try to make sure that they are uh, as versatile as possible in terms of um, the different uh, characteristics. For example, I will try to get pieces of different styles. Uh, some pieces, of course, you know, maybe, you know, neoclassically conceived, like for trackers, uh, some of which um, on, on some of the, you know, neoclassical forms, Pasacali, of which you mentioned of uh, David Hurd. Um, I will have some that are more uh, symphonic inspiration, that sort of thing try to mix up styles, moods, keys, um, composition forms, uh, try to make sure that women are represented uh, in, in as many volumes as possible. So there are many different things that I consider in terms of selecting this music for inclusion. How long have you been working on assembling and editing these anthologies? It started in the the first decade of, of the 21st century, it was somewhere around 2000, a little after 2000, um, I started to move forward. Um, it's been so long now, I don't even recall myself, but um, it's been almost 20 years, believe it or not. It's hard for me to believe. Yeah. <laughs> Do you ever see yourself ending the anthology or in volume nine now? Is there any type of end goal or just to continue to see how many you'd like to produce? I'm going to continue as long as they will allow it. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's the, the goal because there's so much music out there and there's so much that needs to be heard and addressed. And a lot of it was never published. And basically because a lot of publishers, um, particularly in the, the 20th century, um, 
had, how can I say it? Biases against women, against blacks uh, in classical music. And I teach a course in um, Blacks in the Arts, that's the title of the course, which is a study of, of black achievements in uh, music, visual art and theater there at Howard. And one of the things I say to my students, I said, you know, women, black women had it the worst. I said, because they were not only dealing with racism, they were dealing with sexism. And I said, it was very hard to get women, I mean, women who were white to be recognized. You know, um, it was basically a male dominant situation. And so it was hard to break through. And so with African Americans, <clears throat> you didn't have a market for this type of music uh, by African Americans. And it also plays into various stereotypes that, you know, Blacks are good at, you know, jazz, blues, hip hop, gospel, this, that, and the other. But classical music, um, that was something that was never really considered. And so you've had wonderful composers to, to, you know, compose symphonies, piano concerti, string quartets, you name it. Um, but there was never for a long time, let us say, um, an effort to try to get that before the public. So mm -hmm. that is what I'm trying to remedy in terms of the organ world is trying to make this music known and to make it accessible and that people will judge it on its own merit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's stay with organ just for just a minute. Um, what are some of the most um, influential or some of your personal favorite composers and works of um, African-American compo organ composed music? Well, I have quite a few. Uh, it is hard to, to say, I, I'll just mention um, just a few that come off the top of my head. As a matter of fact, I'll start with one particular composer. That was uh, Thomas Kerr. Thomas Kerr was a piano professor, taught at Howard University uh, for many years. And I remember when I first was introduced to his composition. When I was growing up, let me just give you a little, little backdrop here. When I was coming through school, through undergrad, you had to learn, you know, Bach, Buxtehude, De Grigny, Franck, Hindemith, whatever, the standard rep. We did not have black organ music. We did not really, for the most part, most of us, uh, whether you were African-American or not, did not really know about works um, written by black composers. And so I remember a friend of mine had given me a copy of this work of uh, Thomas Curbs called Arietta. And I was reading through it and I stopped right in the middle of it. And I said, my God, I actually spoke to myself, was talking to myself and I said, my God, who is this man? Hmm. And so it was fabulous. And as it turns out, uh, the Arietta had been published by Sami Burchard in, I think, 1957, um, but it had long been out of print. I just got here myself in 56. So it was out of print um, and no longer available. So that is one that does appear, I think, in volume one of the anthology. It was submitted as an entry in an AGO composition contest, and it won first prize, as I recall, out of 150 entries. Wow. And so that's why it was included in the Sammy Burchard um, uh, collection. But after that ran out and was no longer available, it was no longer available. So mm -hmm. I was determined to get that piece, to get the rights to it, to, you know, permission, copyright permission, to be able to include it as a part of the anthology. So Thomas Kerr was a fascinating composer. Um, he taught at Howard. Mark Fax is another one. I was a great favorite of mine. He is a more of a neoclassical bet. Um, Thomas Kerr was more symphonic, but uh, wonderful composers. Uh, Mark Fax taught theory and composition, and uh, he was a teacher of Adolphus Hillstorp. 
as a matter of fact. So he was also a member of the AGO and, 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 and a very brilliant organist. And so he wrote quite a few pieces uh, for the organ. Uh, George Walker was a personal friend of mine. He was the first uh, African-American or first black to ever be awarded the Pulitzer Prize for music back in 1996. And I knew him for about 25 years up until the time he passed in, in uh, 2018. And um, I encouraged him to write more for the organ, but he has a set of three pieces that I recorded on the Albany Records label uh, of, uh, they were called actually three pieces for organ. And they were, were writ originally written in 1958 as part of an Protestant organ mass that he never finished. And so he just, you know, included them as a set of three and had them published. They are wonderful. Um, there are a number of very fine um, composers. Ruth Norman is uh, one that uh, she, re she was from Nebraska and she um, completed her master's in music composition at Eastman. And I ran into her and she was wonderful. She has a piece in I think volume four called Reflections, which she actually was kind enough to dedicate to me. And it is one of the most moving things. One of them, I mean, very profound. Um, I don't have the words to appropriately describe that piece, but it was one of the most moving things I had ever heard. And I thought, what a shame that this is not this type of music is not heard more. So once again, I've been on a personal crusade to try to get the music in print, to talk about it in, in workshops and have master classes and just get it out before the public. I've written articles, the first major articles on African-American classical organ music I authored. So I am, it's been a, a, a crusade it's been a crusade. And so I'm very pleased with the result thus far. And I am grateful to benefit from it as well, because they are wonderful anthologies. And I will say too, Reflections is in volume four, because I have volume four, I just checked. <laughs> <laughs> so it's there. It's there. So one of your specialties as well is not just contributions to the organ repertoire, which is, as we've been discussing, is very important, but also um, African-American classical music as well. Um, which, would you mind chatting about this for a little bit? Well, that was an outgrowth really of my endeavors uh, to get the uh, music of African-Americans uh, out before the public. One of the things I think is necessary, if you're going to, no matter what your instrument happens to be, if you are going to know that instrument and know a particular composer's input or output with regard to that instrument, to me, it's important to know everything about the composer. For example, if you're a pianist and you love Beethoven sonatas, you need to hear the string quartets. You need to know the symphonies. You need to know, um, you know, his, his, his vocal cycles and things like that. You need to have a full breadth of all that, that composer produced in order to get his spirit. You need to read about him, do research about him as a person or her, whomever, and um, really immerse yourself in that person. So in the process of doing this with these individual composers, I wanted to find, okay, now what, like Mark Fax, what else did Mark Fax do? And he has a fabulous string quartet and I happen to hear it, it's never been published but I happen to hear it. And now there are people making efforts to try to perform it and get it published, but it was wonderful. And I started to look at some of the other things that he had composed his uh, art songs, classical anthems, motets, um, just all kinds of, of music. And so I realized that there was a great void in terms of the knowledge of these composers doing these types of things. And so I have been you know, working as, as part of my 
phase two of the crusade is trying to get some of these other things published and performed and call attention of the public to the existence of this music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are some of your own personal favorite works that are outside of the organ realm? Well, there is, you made me think about something that just sort of popped in my mind. One of the things that I've always been curious about, you know, because for example, I love the music of Louis Dier. He is, he has my heart, he really does. <laughs> uh, but I found out um, from an examination that he has some of the most beautiful uh, chamber music. Uh, and there's, there are pieces that have been recorded and I'm just shocked that they're not played more. I mean, it holds its own as easily as any to the uh, uh, chamber music of Debussy or Ravel or Foray, but um, you don't hear about it very much. Um, I love Beethoven. I love anything and everything that he wrote pretty much. Uh, he is fascinating to me as an individual, uh, as a composer. Bach, of course, you know, is right there, but I will have to be very uh, realistic about this. Everything that Bach wrote was not masterful, though he was a master. Everything that he wrote was not a masterpiece uh, in the sense of, of standing equal to everything else. But um, pieces like his Passacalli and Fugue in C minor, which is probably one of my favorite pieces of his, um, that is, if you were going to put that in some kind of time capsule, one piece or one piece of Bach in a time capsule to represent uh, civilization, Western civilization at this point in time, that would be the piece I would suggest. But, you know, there are, are many composers uh, that are, are fascinating to me. And uh, um, I like the works of Jeanne de Maissier. Uh, I thought she was, first of all, she was a phenomenon as a player. And she has some wonderful, like her meditations on the Holy Spirit and some wonderful things in her etudes. Uh, she has some chorale preludes, a set of 12, and there's some lovely pieces in that. So there are all kinds of pieces out here. And, you know, I think organists and, and music lovers just need to know about the works and know about the pieces. And you might have things that you prefer or things to which you might gravitate, but I think you need to know them um, because it will certainly, if nothing else, give you more exposure and then make you appreciate what you do love all the more. But I think that we just need to break down the barriers, put aside our personal biases and just be open-minded, open our minds and open our hearts and our feelings to this music because there are some wonderful pieces out here. I think too, you, you, you said something so important and I don't know if someone's listening who doesn't have a musical logical background may understand how important it is, but it so bears repeating. It's so important to know the people and the context behind the works as well, as you mentioned. Because not only that, like you said, it's possible to find one work that you really enjoy. And then you discover a treasure trove of works or pieces from that composer that might not be played frequently or aren't represented well. I mean, such as your entire anthology, you know, representing the African-American contributions in organ music in particular. It's so important to know what you're playing because what we play and what we choose as organists and as musicians in general, it gives power to the people that wrote it in the first place. I agree. <clears throat> That's why I've been very careful in terms of my selection process, um, things that would be moving. And I've always used this little maxim. Uh, if I'm not sold, on something, I can't sell it to anyone else. Mm -hmm. So every piece that is in that anthology, I have 
been sold on. And so it's my attempt now to sell it to others, to make it available for others. And they can make their own, come to their own conclusions and, mm -hmm. and make their own decisions about it. Mm -hmm. As we wrap up our time here, are there any other thoughts or anything else you'd like to make sure that we, we discuss today? Well, there are some, I remember in, in our conversation, we were talking a little bit uh, about previously about some additional pieces or how, how can I say uh, references, materials. Mm -hmm. And in the anthology, mm -hmm. there is a page on, I don't know if you can see it too well from here, but there are a list of it's a selected bibliography of articles that will give you some information about these composers and the music in general. And so you will find it, uh, for example, there were uh, a couple of um, articles published in the Diapason, uh, one of which was called A Selective Overview, African-American Organ Literature, A Selective Overview that came out in April, 1996. You have another from the Diapason in May, 1998, which is part two of that. It's called A Second Glance, an Overview of African-American Organ Literature. You have uh, in TAO, uh, the American Organist. You have uh, African American Classical Organ Music, A Case of Neglect, that came out in March 1997. And then the other one that I mentioned here is uh, published in a, it's a part of a book, actually, an anthology called Essays in American Music, Volume 4. This came out in 1999. And this is entitled, this article by me is entitled Cultural Perceptions of African American Organ Literature. And so there are some articles out there um, that, you know, will give you some background on the, the uh, literature and the composers. And uh, I think once again, it's important to have that background to understand what you are seeing and, and hearing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, I will post that reference information just in case someone doesn't have one of the anthologies. I will post that information in the show notes of this episode. And I will specifically put the Diapason article from 2003 in the show notes because uh, the, the second glance article, because that actually they made available online. So I will put that in the show notes as well. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Terry. And thank you for the efforts that you have made to make a stronger representation for African-American composers so that we can continue to learn from them and hopefully find more representation for them in our music and in our arts. Thank you so much for having me. And um, I thank the viewers.